Nietzsche had two best friends in school, one of whom would become a Sanskrit professor, studying the origin of the Aryan language from India. And with his health problems, Nietzsche started hanging out with the wrong crowd and was caught drunk at the railroad station. And his friends were expelled. But soon Nietzsche stopped misbehaving and did great on his achievement tests, even though he still struggled with math. When he graduated in September of 1864, Nietzsche went to Bonn University for further schooling, and in Bonn he went to concerts and to the theater, and he went for tea at the homes of his professors, and he went for firelit walks along the Rhine during the wine harvest, and Cezanne was his favorite painter. When his fraternity brothers took Nietzsche to a brothel, he said that he just sat at the piano playing music for the women. And there's no evidence that this trip was where he became infected with syphilis, and Nietzsche had called the piano, quote, the only living thing in the room, close quote. Young Nietzsche, Becoming a Genius, by Carl Pletch, New York, The Free Press, Macmillan, Inc., 1991, page 67. Syphilis was the disease of the century, and spread as armies marched. And the initial sore would go away, but six months later, to a year later a rash would develop, and the rash was infectious, and after that the organism would find a place to hide within the body, and would come out and hide again sporadically. Syphilis was contagious only within the first year of infection, but innocent people would pass it on, and it would take three weeks after the infection to in to incubate, so people who sought help within the first twenty-one days did not pass on the disease. Although syphilis could be passed to a fetus at any time after the year, it could no longer be transmitted by physical contact. Nietzsche's critics would not only accuse him of having contracted syphilis, but also of having contracted it from gay men, and the syphilis myth was the most popular with those offended by Nietzsche's criticism of the church in general, and churchmen in particular. Nietzsche had fallen out with his fraternity brothers at the University of Bonn over there wanting to dispense with the chastity pledge, and he transferred to Leipzig University within a year and changed his major to philology. And when he registered at Leipzig in 1865, it was the exact day Goethe had enrolled 100 years earlier. Nietzsche rented a room with a bookseller, and he didn't attend a single course saying he was more interested in how they taught than what they taught. Philology was the study of the origin and meaning of words, and that meant studying the ancient writings of Greece and Rome. And so Nietzsche was interested in Greek gods and Homeric legends, and philology was about bringing the wisdom of the past into the present. In, 19, in 1865, Nietzsche found a copy of Schopenhauer in a used bookstore, and Nietzsche would write that Schopenhauer thought that sadness was just thwarted joy, and that happiness was like light, and when something got in its way it made a shadow of sorrow. Nietzsche would teach philology in Switzerland, and he applied to become a Swiss citizen, to avoid having to fight in the Kaiser's Wars. And because the disruptions of the 1848 revolutions had mostly been put in the past, Basel had become the most modern European city around, even though it was suffering from a truncated tax base due to the revolutionary fallout. Basel was safe enough from the Franco-Prussian War, and the theology professors told Nietzsche that being a pastor did not require a real belief in God, just a willingness to go along with the general story. And Nietzsche bravely told him he was not qualified to be a minister because he was no good at going along to get along, even though Nietzsche's Nietzsche's had been pastors as far back as anyone could remember. Nietzsche had a conception of God that was different than the majority of church scholars, and he said that when he read Schopenhauer, he felt like he was, quote, being stared at by the great and impartial eye of art. Pletch, page 70. Nietzsche didn't follow the Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Hegel construction. He only followed Schopenhauer because Nietzsche was fundamentally only a philologist, and that made him much more than a poet. His writings 
were a series of thought operas, and he was a conductor who used words rather than music. So when he had applied for the teaching job in Switzerland, they turned him down at first because Nietzsche wasn't. Nietzsche said he wanted to teach philosophy, and he wasn't qualified. With a letter from his professor friend from Leipzig, Nietzsche was given an appointment as Professor Extraordinarius in 1869, and Nietzsche was an excellent teacher and very popular with his students, and he was only 24 years old when he was made professor at the University of Basel, an incredibly rare event, and he'd been given a full professorship before even finishing his thesis. Nietzsche had been considering going to Paris to study natural science, but with the Franco-Prussian War breaking out, he went to work in Basel instead because he would have invariably gotten caught up on the wrong side of the Franco-Prussian War. Nietzsche had to relinquish his Prussian citizenship to teach in Basel, and he gave his inaugural speech on Homer, but he never did become a Swiss citizen, so he remained a man without a country. Nietzsche taught in Switzerland for ten years, and he got along well with everyone, even though many didn't appreciate what he came up with on paper. And when he refused a job offer at another university, the students gave Nietzsche a torchlight parade. When the Franco-Prussian War broke out, Nietzsche volunteered for the army as a medical orderly, and that episode ruined his health, and he was sent home after two weeks with diphtheria and dysentery. While nobody talked about Nietzsche and opium, he would have regularly given it to the wounded soldiers, and he wrote letters home about how dreadfully injured they were, and he spent most of his time trying to keep them out of the weather. Nietzsche had been sent to the front lines after a ten-day first aid course, and he reached the battlefield on the 29th of August in 1870, and by the 14th of September, Nietzsche was sent home sick. Three years earlier, Nietzsche had been put in the cavalry in 1867 because everyone had to do some time in the military, and he'd been hurt riding a horse even though he was an excellent rider, and that injury had gotten him sent home. When Prussia and France went to war this time in 1870, Nietzsche volunteered to fight for Prussia and was made a medic because the Swiss thought it sounded more neutral. Nietzsche needed to live continuously in Switzerland for eight years before he could apply for citizenship, but he'd left Switzerland to go do his duty in the war, and he would leave again six years later. Within a month of coming back from the Franco-Prussian War, Nietzsche was back to teaching, and he finished his first book called The Birth of Tragedy in 1872, and it was about the origins of music in ancient Greece and he wrote it from lectures he'd been giving at the beginning of 1870. Having shared his lecture notes with Wagner, the birth of tragedy caught Wagner's attention, and Nietzsche started hanging out with Wagner for the next five years, while he continued to write books and teach school. Nietzsche got into a fight with Wagner over Wagner's abhorrence of Jews, but what really got to Nietzsche was that he thought Wagner's Parzival was written just to make money off of Christians. Nietzsche said that writing opera just to make money turned art into political prostitution, and basically Nietzsche thought that Wagner's putting on airs turned him instead into a pompous ass. German folk had become common and earthy, due to the constant toppling of the nobility during Germany's incessant wars of religion, and the British looked down on all German nobles as not much better than peasants. The question for the German had always predominantly been, why do men and women fall in love? And they didn't just ask the question, they sang and danced about it. The story of Tristan had first been written by an Englishman in Eleanor of Aquitaine's court, and while most of it had become lost, what remained was transformed into a specifically German rock song. In German poetry, love was transcendent and magical, and prevailed in the face of death and disaster, and even if the quest for love brought down an entire kingdom, it would emerge triumphant in the end. Wagner's ring about the Nibelunion was uniquely German, rather than the more mild pastoral poetry written by the English 
and Hitler did not want to conquer England, because he wanted the English royals to recognize him as their cultural cousin and treat him as a proper not neighboring sovereign. And Hitler swore to Eva that he would not marry her until he could make her the queen of the fatherland. Like Adolf Hitler, German kings had come from Austria for 600 years until 1867 when the Prussians took over. And with the rise of opera and theater displacing the Minnesongers and bringing about the decline of the rock songs, the chivalric code had faded into a distant memory, and Hitler wanted to bring all that back. And he had his portrait painted, wearing a suit of armor on horseback while flying a Nazi banner. Nietzsche and his contemporaries at Basel had pointed German philosophy towards rediscovering the origins of Western civilization. And that meant going back to the Greeks and looking at the very beginnings of the meanings of words in the original. And when the Nazis picked up on the idea, people started dressing up in Greek costumes and having pagan festivals and parades, and instead of pushing scholars for philosophical explanations, Hitler sent an archaeological squad to dig up ancient Troy. For his scholar friends who were dredging up the past, it was more entertainment than academic, especially for their students. While it remained a serious field of study that would be given the name phenomenology by a Jewish professor while Hitler was signing up members of the Nazi party. In Nietzsche's inaugural speech at Basel, he made the point that Homer didn't write the Iliad and the Odyssey. And while Nietzsche's classes about philology sought to bring the past into the present, talking about the Greeks was frowned on by the church because it was studying a time before Jesus had arrived and was therefore irrelevant to the church. Ordinary people enjoyed what Nietzsche was writing because the old Greek gods were more like humans than the glowing saintly apparitions replicated in the artwork of the church. Nietzsche said that Wagner's opera had, quote, no flesh and too much blood of sacramental communion, close quote, because the church had the money to influence Wagner, but there was also so much morality that money could buy, because Wagner did not think that adultery should have been included in the Ten Commandments, and he wrote an opera about a French knight whose true love must die to save him after he got lost in Venusburg, a fantasy planet where there was free love. Wagner thought of himself as a kind of father of the arts, and he wanted listening to his music to be a religious experience, just as the Greeks had engaged in group music before marching off to war. And Wagner would start signing his letters Deacon, or in the German Oberkirchenrat. Nietzsche moved in with the Wagners in the summer of 1869, and Nietzsche would compose music spontaneously on the piano for hours at a time at Wagner's house, and being allowed to play Wagner's piano was a very big deal. The Birth of Tragedy was about how the god of wine and death became Apollo, the god of the joy of the living. And Wagner drank a great deal of wine and would peek out the windows, afraid that Jews were going to come and kill him. The mad king Ludwig had dreamed of building a theater for Wagner's operas at his fantasy castle, but it never got built because Ludwig's parents cut back on his allowance, so construction had to wait until the building of the opera house at Bayreuth, and Nietzsche would be there for the laying of the cornerstone on Wagner's 59th birthday in 1872. The Mad King Ludwig kept giving Wagner money, and the Germans who really ran the government made him stop after a couple years, because patriotism had been the thing to do right after the war, even if it meant encouraging Wagner. But there were limits to how much money Ludwig II was allowed to waste on his fantasies. Nietzsche had moved in with Wagner even though his secretary Cosima Liszt was still married to von Bülow. <clears throat> And on her 32nd birthday in 1870, Cosima read Wagner's Parzival out loud to Nietzsche while Wagner was taking a nap. And that had been possible because the great composer was tired out from working on his Gotterdammerung. Wagner had added, an, had added extra romance to his version of Parzival, and it was a piece that had been contracted by the Mad King Ludwig.
and had been written after Cosima's father Franz Liszt had taken her to Budapest in 1865 to see the first performance of his The Legend of St. Elizabeth that was about a wedding and crusader knights heading off to the Holy Land. Cosima had been working as Wagner's secretary since the summer of 1864 and had shared with him her interest in that sort of opera and Wagner's version of the Parzival story had the hero take away the throne from a sinful king, an evil man disguised as either Cosima's father or her husband. Cosima had grown up playing the piano and wrote a scene for her husband von Bülow about the magician Merlin at the court of King Arthur, but her husband had shown no interest in her contribution, although he was a fervent admirer of Wagner. Von Bülow had taken Cosima and their two young daughters to live with Wagner for the summer in 1862 when Cosima was 24 years old and Wagner was 49, and they stayed in a house on the Rhine River, and at the time the Von Bülows had been married for five years. Wagner and von Bülow shared projects and crossed paths for the following two years until the King of Bavaria died unexpectedly of a unexpectedly of a brief illness at the age of 52, and the Mad King was given the keys to the Bavarian treasury in the spring of 1864, allowing Wagner's fortune to take a dramatic turn upwards. With the patronage of Ludwig II, the von Bülows and Wagner quickly moved to Munich to put his operas on the stage. Nietzsche met Wagner for the first time at Wagner's sister's house and Wagner had entertained them and played the piano, and Nietzsche had thought he was very lively. Cosima had written Nietzsche a letter after his first visit, saying that he would, quote, bring her luck, close quote, and she wrote twice to him, and Cosima in her diary on the 31st of January in 1870 wrote, No entries for a whole week. Spent most of the time with Professor Nietzsche, who left yesterday. Nietzsche's diary said his visit had been, quote, one of my most cherished and uplifting memories, close quote, and Nietzsche and Cosima threw themselves into making music with Wagner. When he'd gone to meet Wagner for the first time, Nietzsche's new suit hadn't been finished on time and was delivered a half hour before he was due to leave. Then he didn't have the money for the delivery man, so they wrestled over the suit and it became torn and Nietzsche had to go in his old suit. Before moving in with Wagner, Nietzsche had been riding the train for several hours to visit, and Wagner was the same age as Nietzsche's father would have been, and Nietzsche had taken two jobs, teaching at the high school as well as at the university, and he suffered from health problems and started seeing ghosts. Nietzsche's mother had taken him to see the Jesus play at Oberammergau, and Nietzsche confided to his mother that at night he was having visions of the Virgin Mary as portrayed in the play, and he said that she appeared to him as the perfection of pure beauty, the perfection of pure beauty of which woman and only woman could attain, and he shared this vision with Wagner, who said that he saw the same thing. Wagner had started dictating his autobiography to Co Cosima after finishing his ring operas, hiring her to take dictation when she was 25 and he was 50, and Cosima would bear their first daughter two years later, and then a second girl followed by the son named Siegfried, while the two daughters from her first marriage would stay with her, their father. Wagner's son Siegfried, was born the first night Nietzsche slept over at their house in 1869, and Cosima's father's children had been born out of wedlock too, and Wagner would conduct more than a few affairs behind Cosima's back, and when Wagner began losing fans for having broken up Cosima's marriage, he blamed the Jews that people disapproved of him, and he began, began arguing with Nietzsche. <clears throat> Wagner was probably reacting to Nietzsche's best friend being Jewish and had been trying to drive a wedge between them so Nietzsche would pay more attention to Wagner. 
Nietzsche had arrived at Wagner's house just after some scathing anti-Semitic writing that Wagner had written 20 years before was finally published. And when Nietzsche showed up, Wagner had been planning a big party and was in a good mood, and people were saying that the Jew bashing was his attempt to divert attention away from the fact that he had just destroyed Cosima's marriage and she was about to give birth to his third baby. On Christmas Eve in 1870, Cosima read Wagner's Parzival out loud to Nietzsche while Wagner was taking a nap, and hearing it read aloud, Nietzsche became smitten over Cosima. When Nietzsche had first showed up, they told him to come back in a couple days, and he wrote a letter, excerpted by Curler, that said, quote, A more spiritual philosophy of life, close, close quote, had been, quote, lost to us Germans through the arrogant behavior of the Jews, close quote. And it was possible that this letter said something about Judaic tradition versus German philosophy, which was typical Nietzsche and not anti-Semitic. Nietzsche also said some sarcastic stuff about Jews in genealogy of morals, but made them synonymous with Christians, and the few other anti-Jew lines were mostly meant to please Wagner and Cosima since he was trying to live with them at the time. The weird thing about Wagner's Jew-hating was that Cosima's grandfather, grandmother was Jewish, and Nietzsche was careful about the word anti-Semitism since it included Arabs and was a phrase left over from the Crusades. And instead, he used the word misojuden from the Greek misos that meant hatred. People would come over to the Wagners to copy music, and Wagner asked Nietzsche to engrave a coat of arms for the Wagners that included a vulture, and he was asked to organize their library and send out books to be rebound, and he had to get Wagner's autobiography ready for publication, which was being dictated to Cosima, and he also had to paste newspaper articles in their scrapbook and write letters to their editor. Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy, was not published until 1872, and Nietzsche didn't make very much money teaching philology, and his job at the University of Basel paid the exact amount of the rent on Wagner's house. The house was on a lake, with a boathouse and a mountain view, and the Wagners employed a governess and a nanny, a housekeeper and her husband, a manservant, a cook, and a housemaid. And the Wagners also had two big dogs and two horses, two peacocks and some sheep and cats and chickens and bats. Instead of just thinking and talking and writing, Nietzsche was very impressed that Wagner was actually doing something. And for the next four years, he would write about Wagner from the birth of tragedy to Bayreuth. It was through tragedy that myth achieved its profoundest context, its most expressive form. It arose one, once again like a wounded warrior, its eyes alight with unspent power and the calm wisdom of the dying. Birth of Tragedy by Friedrich Nietzsche from the Birth of Tragedy and the Genealogy of Morals. Translated by Francis Golfing, New York. Doubleday Bantam Anchor Books, Dell Pub Publishing, 1956, page 68. Wagner liked to dress up in women's nightdresses and ball gowns, although he hated homosexuals, and he would fight with Cosima and would read her diary, sometimes making comments in the margins. And Cosima thought that Wagner was just upset that year in 1869 because he was the same age that Beethoven had been when he died. Cosima insisted on having separate bedrooms, but Wagner insisted on having separate floors, and Cosima started holding seances and began seeing ghosts, and Wagner would accuse Cosima of spending too much time with Nietzsche, and he started calling Nietzsche a gay and a Jew lover and forbade him to play the piano anymore. Someone said that Wagner played piano like a rat plays the flute. <clears throat> And Wagner and Franz, Franz Strauss had both been up for the same job as conductor in Munich. And when the new Mad King's budget favored Wagner, Nietzsche took the side of Cosima's husband and in writing called Strauss not only a drunk, but also a Jew. In Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche accused Strauss of being a drunk after the 
uh, anti-Strauss essay, essay, Nietzsche put his list of, quote, subjects to attack, quote, in his bottom drawer and decided to devote his mind to activities other than settling Wagner's old scores for him, a move that provoked Wagner's displeasure. Nietzsche and Wagner, A Lesson in Subjugation by Joachim K Kurler, translated by Ronald Taylor, New Haven, Yale University Press, 1998, page 97, originally published in Hamburg under the title Friedrich Nietzsche and und Cosima Wagner. When Strauss died, Nietzsche felt terrible about the book he'd written castigating Strauss, and Cosima told him not to be so weak. And as Nietzsche suffered migraines, he got hooked on chloral and would write untimely meditations in 1876 that could also be translated as unfashionable observations. That year, Nietzsche took a copy of a Brahms concert and put it on Wagner's piano, and Wagner went into a rage, and Nietzsche stayed away for two years after that, and he wrote Human All Too Human, in which Nietzsche said that leaving Wagner behind was like recovering. The big fight between Nietzsche and Wagner had reached a crescendo in 1876, when Wagner read his 20-year-old essay about Jews being evil out loud to a small audience at the opening of the Bayreuth Festival, and the essay said that the decline of German culture had been their fault, and Nietzsche took issue with it, so Wagner began telling people that Nietzsche had gone mad as the result of saying that God was dead, even though that was not at all what Nietzsche had written. It may have been simply that German Jews had been allowed into the universities at the same time Wagner had started composing, and Jews had been allowed to participate in German life for the first time, and Wagner couldn't stand the competition. Wagner's stepfather was the Jewish man Mr. Geyer. Wagner's stepfather, the Jewish man Mr. Geyer, was an artist, an oil painter, and a court actor, and whether or not he had been Wagner's biological father was unknown, and the Nazis vanished any records about it, although it was known where Wagner was buried, so genetic testing might find out for sure, but nobody has yet been willing to dig him up to find out. Wagner's real father, Karl Friedrich Wilhelm Wagner, had died of typhus after fighting in the Battle of the Nations in 1813, and his son Richard had used Geyer's name for years until changing it back to Wagner so it wouldn't sound so Jewish. At the grand opening of Bayreuth in 1876, showcasing Wagner's ring, many people brought flowers while Nietzsche donated a funeral wreath and he didn't watch the show, but stayed in his room claiming that he had a headache and that his eyes were bothering him. Wagner wanted the audience to be transformed by his music, but instead they just got drunk and behaved like any other crowd on vacation. Five years earlier, as the result of the great national victory in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, the Kaiser had become the German emperor and he came in person to the grand opening of Wagner's Bayreuth Festival amid rowdy pomp and circumstance. Kaiser Wilhelm I had already been crowned the King of Prussia ten years earlier in 1861 when his father Frederick Wilhelm III died at the age of 65, and now Wilhelm I had become the Emperor of Germany in what was unified with Prussia as the heralded Second Reich. Prussia had been a crusader state of the Teutonic Knights and had been called Teutonic Prussia before the Grand Master converted to Protestant Protestantism in 1510, and that had made the state religion Protestant and Prussia had welcomed Poles fleeing from Poland's Catholics. The Prussians elected the King of Poland to be their liege lord for the new Duchy of Prussia in 1525 and they had kept their capital at Königsberg, and the state of Prussia would become a kingdom in 1701, and on the 6th of August in 1806, the throne of the Holy Roman Empire would be put away for safekeeping to keep it away from the unbeatable Napoleon. 
the Kaiser attending the opening of the Bayreuth Festival 70 years later had been nine years old when the title of the Holy Roman Emperor had been put in the closet, and he held on to the romantic notion of bringing back the Holy Roman Empire and to prove it. Wilhelm I had the cathedral in Cologne finished by 1880, and it had the largest facade in the world. And at the time, the Cologne Cathedral was also the tallest building until the Americans put the capstone on the Washington Monument in 1884, although both would be eclipsed by the Eiffel Tower in 1889. When he became Emperor of Germany in 1871 at the age of 73, Wilhelm I had already been crowned the King of Prussia at Königsberg on the anniversary of the Battle of the Nations fought at Leipzig on the 18th of October in 1813, and that had been the turning point where Napoleon was decisively defeated for the first time, and Wilhelm I had been 16 years old during the Battle of the Nations, and he well remembered their victory over the French. <clears throat> Wilhelm I had been an officer in the Prussian army. Wilhelm I had been an officer in the Prussian army since the age of 12, and after becoming the Emperor of Germany in 1871, Wilhelm I would live another 17 years until his grandson Wilhelm II became the Kaiser in 1888 and would lead the fatherland of Germany into the Great War. At first, Germany had imported Britain's railroad technology, but the Germans quickly developed their own by 1850, and good railway connections were made to the ports of Bremen and Hamburg. By 1880, German had ten, Germany had 10,000 locomotives, and by the Great War they were running their trains over 40,000 miles of railway lines, an increase from the 13,000 miles laid in 1850, and that was second only to America and well above Britain's 20,000 miles of track. After becoming the emperor of the new unified Germany ten years after being crowned king of Prussia, Wilhelm I attended the opening of the Bayreuth Opera House in a, at a time when there was not a single German-speaking person who did not see him as the legitimate Holy Roman Emperor of the unified fatherland that was now being called the Second Reich. The town of Bayreuth had been built up by Frederick the Great's favorite sister Wilhelmina after the devastation of the Thirty Years' War, and Wilhelmina had married the Prince of Bayreuth in 1731, and they had only one girl child who was called the most beautiful woman in Germany. But she would suffer an unhappy marriage and have only one child who died at the age of 13 months. Wilhelmina's mother had borne fourteen children, among them Frederick the Great, and ten of her children had lived, and four of them had died, and at her wedding to the King of Prussia in 1706, Frederick the Great's mother had participated in a faculton's torch dance that had kicked off six weeks' worth of banquets and balls, and the wedding had been held in Hanover because Wilhelmina's mother had been the daughter of Britain's King George I. With the resurgence of Germany under Wilhelm I and Bismarck, the Kaiser and his entourage got off the train at Bayreuth for the Wagner Festival in 1876 and came through town in a parade where the Kaiser, quote, could scarcely be seen due to the vast number of banners and wreaths. Pletch, page 199. <coughs> Much of the German nobility had come for the show at Bayreuth, thinking it was wonderful for Germany that Wagner was bringing the old folk stories and rock songs back to life. But they didn't help pay any of the bills, and when it closed, the Bayreuth Festival would be 150,000 marks in debt. The Ring Operas had taken 25 years to write, and they took 15 hours to perform, and people did not seem to be transformed by Wagner's music the way he had intended, but they had simply, but they had instead simply enjoyed the festival atmosphere. 
Nietzsche was disgusted and even more disgusted with Wagner for enjoying it all so much. How typical of the Kaiser, he wrote. At the same time as he applauded, he turned to Count Lendorf, his adjutant, and exclaimed, Terrible! Absolutely terrible! Nietzsche and Wagner, page 115. Marx wrote that Wagner was, quote, the government band leader. And at Bayreuth, people heard Wagner say that he wished the theater would burn down. Nietzsche gave Wagner his new book, Untimely Meditations, but the Wagners only skimmed through it because they were busy with the festival and they laid it on the coffee table. The complete title of Birth of Tragedy had been The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music, and Nietzsche had written that mere emotion cannot create art, and he said that it was not true that, quote, every sensitive man is at bottom an artist, close quote. To Nietzsche, music was deeper than thinking, so poetry sent, set to music should have been the best art possible. Music alone allows us to understand the delight felt at the annihilation of the individual, the omnipotent will behind individuation, eternal life continuing beyond all appearance, and the eternal life of the will remains ineffective. Tragedy cries, we believe that life is eternal, and the music is the direct expression of that life. Birth of Tragedy, page 102. Nietzsche liked that opera glorified people instead of treating them as Martin Luther thought people were, damned and up to no good. And Nietzsche said one of the worst things about music was when people insisted on being able to hear the words. To Professor Nietzsche, philology was about learning the truth about the past, and music was about learning to feel the truth. And Nietzsche called Wagner's music, quote, tone painting, rather than true music. Nietzsche thought that if music wasn't real, there would be no, quote, unquote, metaphysical solace in it, like a play without a happy ending. Already in Euripides, things get out of control as soon as his characters of his chorus begin to sing, and heaven only knows what his impudent followers may have been guilty of. Birth of Tragedy, page 107. At Bayreuth, Nietzsche started to write Ecce Homo, or Behold the Man. What had happened? Wagner had been translated into a German. German art. The German master. German beer. On the Genealogy of Mortals, Morals, Ecce Homo, edited by Walter Kaufmann, New York Random House, 1967, page 201, translated by Kaufmann from Nietzsche, Werk, Kritisch Gesamthausgabe, 6, 3, 321, page 284. When nobody responded to Wagner's music the way he wanted, he started changing it, and Pletch said that his next two operas were, quote, musically incomprehensible, close quote. After that, Wagner gave up trying to talk to people through music, and he wrote only for himself. People began to listen to Wagner for its theme of anti-Semitism, and with his association with Wagner, Nietzsche would be painted with the same brush. Professionally, Nietzsche had taken issue explicitly with Wagner's music, but personally he was sickened by how easily Wagner had cheated on Cosima. So Wagner retaliated by writing letters to Nietzsche's doctor saying that Nietzsche was a masturbator. And when Nietzsche told Cosima that Wagner's father was Jewish, Cosima accused Nietzsche of being a plagiarist, and Cosima burned all Nietzsche's letters written to her. Wagner had been reading her outgoing letters and would approve them if she said sour things about Nietzsche, and Cosima had been very careful not to give any hint, hint of affection towards Nietzsche that Wagner might notice. Nietzsche had found out at the Bayreuth festival that the women in Wagner's operas had been drawn from the women with whom Wagner had affairs behind Cosima's back, and at Bayreuth they had mocked Nietzsche and told him that he couldn't play their piano anymore, and they told him that his writing was childish and accused him of deserting them when, by having stayed away when they moved to Bayreuth during the construction of the opera hall, even though he'd still been holding down the teaching position at Basel. 
When people asked where Nietzsche was during the Ring Operas, Wagner and Cosima told them that he suffered headaches because he masturbated, since the rumor was not being believed that his Jewish friend Ray was gay. I long to get away from here, he wrote to his sister. The thought of all these long evenings of music fills me with dread. Nietzsche and Wagner, page 114. Wagner's not a composer at all, writes Nietzsche, but an instinctive theatrical talent who, dissatisfied with the easy pickings that lay readily to hand, has forced his way into the other arts. Nietzsche and Wagner, page 120. In his essay, Richard Wagner in Bayreuth, Nietzsche said that Wagner was like an insect that lays its eggs where it knows they will find food, then dies content. In 1878, Nietzsche wrote Human All Too Human that he subtitled A Book for Free Spirits, and he dedicated it to Voltaire, and that year he retired with a pension from the University of Basel at the age of 34 and would travel between Switzerland, Italy, and France for the next 10 years while writing a book every year until 1888 when Kaiser Wilhelm I died. In 1882, Nietzsche had met Louise von Salome, who had become a friend of Nietzsche's Jewish friend Ray, and Louis Salome was 21 years old, and Nietzsche was 38, and Ray was 33, and the three of them <clears throat> became inseparable for five months in the summer of 1882. Nietzsche had taken a picture of them pulling her cart while Salome whipped them on. And while some said it was a lily branch, others said it was lilac, and it would be this picture that inspired Nietzsche's whip remarks in his Zarathustra. The trio went to Tautenberg for three weeks, and Nietzsche took Zalame to the monument for the Swiss guard killed in Paris during the French Revolution, a statue of a lion known as the Blonde Beast, lying dead next to his Swiss shield. And Nietzsche played Beethoven's Ode to Joy for her with plenty of fervor and personality. And Nietzsche also offered to marry her three times because people were calling her a loose woman, especially because she was living with a Jew. Lou Zalame's father was a Russian general who gave her an allowance as long as she stayed single. <coughs> And the threesome went to the theater and to the opera in Leipzig, where Nietzsche was applying for a lecturing position at the university. But Wagner's smears had taken their toll, and Nietzsche was turned down for the job. The university told him it was because he had said God was dead, but Nietzsche had said that the devil said that God was dead, and Zalame and Ray left for Paris without Nietzsche, who had just heard that Wagner was dead of a heart attack. Nietzsche had been taking large doses of opium in 1882, and now he began taking chloral hydrate in 1883. And it had been no accident that Nietzsche had taken Zalame and Ray to see the Lion Monument at Tautenberg, because Tautenberg was 35 miles away by train from where Wagner had been putting on his second Bayreuth festival in May of 1882. Having finally finished his definitive version of Parsifal that January, <coughs> Wagner was already suffering from angina during the 16th and final performance of Parsifal at Bayreuth on the 29th of August in 1882, and he'd gone into the orchestra pit and taken the baton away from the Jewish conductor to finish the final performance himself. And after that, the Wagners had gone to Venice for the winter where he died of a heart attack on the 13th of February in 1883 at the age of 69, and they made a death mask of him. As soon as Nietzsche heard that Wagner had died of a bad heart, he began writing Zarathustra, and the complete title of the book was Thus Spake Zarathustra, a book for everyone and no one. Zarathustra was supposed to mimic the New Testament with four books, and Nietzsche wrote the first part in ten days, and then he began Beyond Good and Evil and the Genealogy of Morality. 
Should this should this treatise seem unintelligible or jarring to some readers, I think the fault need not necessarily be laid at my door. It is plain enough, and it presumes only that the reader will have read my earlier works with some care, for they do in fact require careful reading. As regards my Zarathustra, I think no one should claim to know it who has not been, by turns, deeply wounded and deeply delighted by what it says. Genealogy of Mortar Morals, translated by Golfing, section 8, page 157. Zalame would marry a professor who stabbed himself in the chest to get her to agree to marry him, and Zalame made her husband change his first name to Friedrich. After becoming a friend of the Jewish Dr. Freud, the Nazis would purge her library of Jewish books when she died in Germany in 1937 at the age of 75. Two years later, having learned the value of motorcycles during his days in the Great War, Hitler started off his own war with 200,000 motorcycles and as many copies of Zarathustra, and there would be English translations other than Kaufmann, but he was far and above the best, having chosen English words that were closest to the author's intention. Walter Kaufmann had been born in Freiburg in 1921, and he came to America in 1939 to enlist in the U.S. Army Air Force, and he served in Germany as an interrogator in the military intelligence service, and he became an American citizen in 1944. Kaufman earned a Ph.D. in 1947 with his dissertation that was entitled Nietzsche's Theory of Values, and among his extensive literary work, Kaufman also translated Martin Buber's I and Thou. It should be noted that in the original German, Nietzsche's writing contained much more humor, so from Kaufman's Zarathustra, my, lie, my wise longing cried and laughed thus out of me. Born in the mountains, verily a wild wisdom, my great broad-winged longing. And often it swept me away and up and far in the middle of my laughter. And I flew, quivering an arrow through sun-drunken delight, away into distant futures which no dream had n yet seen, into hotter souths than artists ever dreamed of, where gods in their dances are ashamed of all clothes, to speak in parables and to limp and stammer like poets, and verily I am ashamed that I must still be a poet. Thus spoke Zarathustra third part on old and new tablets, the portable Nietzsche, selected and translated with an introduction, prefaces, and notes, translated by Walter Kaufman, New York, The Viking Press, 1954-1967, page 309. In the eighteenth chapter of The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche said there were two great first poets, Homer and Archilochus, Archilochus who he called the hoary dreamer and the first artist to be called subjective who writes with the strider of his hate and mockery the drunken outbursts of his desire people who never read nietzsche took up the rumor about his being insane and for the most part it would stick coupled with the distrust he engendered from having never married the truth is that he had fallen prey to keeping on a tray, innumerable bottles and jars and potions, against the migraines, which often render him all but senseless for hours, against his stomach cramps, against spasmodic vomiting, against the slothful intestines, and above all the dreadful sedatives against his insomnia, chloral hydrate, and varinal, a frightful arsenal of poisons and drugs. The por Portable Nietzsche, page 104. While living in Turin, in 1888, Nietzsche wrote a letter to the Italian king calling him my son and told him that all anti-Semites had been silenced because Nietzsche's writing had recreated the world and Nietzsche signed his name the Crucified One and it was probably all the Italian wine he was drinking because Nietzsche started to sign his letters Dionysus and he would dance naked in his turret room while the landlady watched through the, through the keyhole. The madness theory was readily taken up by the church people to make it sound as though denying God would certainly drive people mad. 
and a professor friend of Nietzsche came to visit him in Turin and took him away to a health sanitarium where he could rest and be taken care of by nice nurses, one facility in Switzerland and another in Jena, Jena in Germany. A photo of Nietzsche was taken a year before he died and he looked just like an ordinary old professor, well fed and comfortable and his sister took him home in 1893 to take care of him until he died on the 25th of August in 1900 at the age of 56. Nietzsche died before finishing The Will to Power, so his sister finished it for him and published it a year after his death. Nietzsche had left behind scattered pieces of The Will to Power, and she used for her version, oh, that she used for her version, that would be very unlike the writing of Nietzsche, and The Will to Power would be the book heralded by the Nazis. Nietzsche's sister exploited her dead brother without mercy, burning all the fiction he had written in high school, and only a part of a novel called Euphorian was saved. In 1888, Nietzsche had changed the title of The Will to Power to The Revaluation of All Values, and he had intended, it f he had intended for it to be his master work. Ecce Homo was also finished after he died, and like Zarathustra, it was in four parts to mimic the New Testament, and those four parts were 1. Why I am so smart. 2. Why I am so clever. 3. Why I write such great books. and 4. Why I am a destiny. When Nietzsche's sister died in 1935, Hitler welp wept at her funeral. When Nietzsche's sister died in 1935, Hitler wept at her funeral, and he planned to build a monument to Nietzsche, but he would be distracted by the war. Hitler ordered a revised edition of Zarathustra printed up and had all the anti-anti-Semitism cut out. And Hitler ordered that every German soldier be sent off to battle with a copy where it would be welcomed as precious toilet paper. It would not be until 1956 that a correct copy of Nietzsche was allowed to be published in Germany and it would leave out the pirated will to power that had been sabotaged by his sister. And when the Berlin Wall came down, East Germans were finally allowed to read the entire works of Nietzsche. The writer of this history, Anonymous, exercised an artistic liberty in the following arrangement of his prose, a liberty assumed as appropriate in defense of the poet. Thus spoke the devil to me once, God too has his hell, that is his love of man, and most recently I heard him say this, God is dead, God died of his pity for man. They have called God what was contrary to them and gave them pain, and verily there was much of the heroic in their adoration, and they did not know how to love their God except by crucifying man. And when they say I am just, it always sounds like I am just revenged. With their virtue they want to scratch out the eyes of their enemies, and they exalt themselves only to humble others. And then again there are such as consider it virtue to say, virtue is necessary, but at the bottom they believe only that the police is necessary. Truthful I call him who goes into godless deserts, having broken his revering heart. In the yellow sands burned by the sun, he squints thirstily at the islands abounding in wells, where living things rest under dark trees. Yet his thirst does not persuade him to become like these, dwelling in comfort, for where there are oases, there are also idols." Hungry, violent, lonely, godless, thus the lion will wants itself, free from the happiness of slaves, redeemed from gods and adorations, fearless and fear-inspiring, great and lonely, such is the will of the truthful. It was ever in the desert that the truthful have dwelt the free spirits as masters of the desert, but in the cities dwell, dwell the well-fed, famous wise men. But in the cities dwell the well-fed, famous wise men, the beasts of burden, for as asses they always pull the people's cart. Not that I am angry with them for that, but for me they remain such as serve and work in a harness, even when they shine in harnesses of gold. For often 
They have been good servants, worthy of praise, for thus speaks virtue. If you must be a servant, seek him who profits most from your service. The spirit and virtue of your master shall grow by your being his servant. Then you yourself will grow with his spirit and his virtue. And verily, you famous wise men, you servants of the people, you yourselves have grown with the spirit and virtue of the people and the people through you. In your honor I say this, but even in our virtue, you remain for me part of the people, the dumb-eyed people, the people who do not know what spirit is. Spirit is the life that itself cuts into life. With its own agony, it increases its own knowledge. Did you know that? And the blindness of the blind and their seeking and groping shall yet bear witness to the power of the sun into which they have looked. Did you know that? You know only the spark of the spirit, but you do not see the anvil that it is, nor the cruelty of its hammer. In all things you act too familiarly with the spirit, and you have often made wisdom into a poorhouse and a hospital for bad poets. You are no eagles, hence you have never experienced the happiness that is in the terror of the spirit, and he who is not a bird should not build his nest over abysses. Have you never seen a sail go over the sea, rounded and taut and trembling with the violence of the wind? Like the sail trembling with the violence of the spirit, my wisdom goes over the sea, my wild wisdom. But you servants of the people, you famous wise men, how could you go with me? Alas, where shall I climb now with my longing? From all mountains I look out for fatherlands and motherlands, but home I found nowhere. A fugitive am I in all cities, and a departure at all gates. Strange and a mockery to me are the men of today, to whom my heart recently drew me. And I am driven out of fatherlands and motherlands. Thus I now love only my children's land, yet undiscovered in the farthest sea. For this I bid my sails search and search. In my children I want to make up for being the child of my fathers, and to all the future for this today. Thus spoke Zarathustra, the portable Nietzsche. Zarathustra, second part, translated by Kaufman, page 202, 204, 207, 215 through 17, and 233. When Nietzsche w was born, there were a million industrial workers in Germany. And by the time he wrote Zarathustra, there were 17 million. And by the end of the Great War, 40,000 copies of Zarathustra had been sold. Because so much of Germany was just endless miles of flat land, the flatlanders fell hard for all of Nietzsche's mountain mythology, not unlike America's, Americans on the East Coast going full out for tall tales about the Wild West. Nietzsche said that good philosophers avoid, quote, three th shiny, loud things, fame, princes, and women. Genealogy of Morals, translated by Golfing, page 245. And while Nietzsche was publishing Beyond Good and Evil in 1886, the mad King Ludwig was declared insane and arrested by the royal ministers, and they had to do it secretly because the peasants truly loved him. The next day... <clears throat> Ludwig, too, was found dead in the lake in waist-deep water along with his doctor, who was also dead, and the doctor showed signs of being beaten and strangled. The doctor had been shorter and smaller than Ludwig, too, and the evidence emerged, and evidence emerged, that Ludwig had been, had been trying to escape to a boat waiting for him when he was shot twice in the back. So the rescuers had dispatched the doctor, but History Anonymous has yet to solve the puzzle, although all clues point to a palace coup, and their success would be brief, as the Great War soon washed them all away, and monarchy in Germany ended with their defeat. The Mad King Ludwig had become a knight in shining armor in Wagner's operas, and Hitler would listen to Wagner's music and indulge himself in euphoric recall about the days of the vigorous, gallant knights.
and Hitler believed himself worthy of fulfilling that role for Germany according to the old legend of the great German King Barbarossa sleeping in a cave somewhere around Salzburg, his beard growing around a stone table as he waited to be awakened, and when that happy day arrived he would save the world from disaster and chaos. So when Hitler called the invasion of Russia Operation Barbarossa, everyone knew exactly what he meant and recognized that he was loading a very big cultural gun. With a jealous sister and a Jew-hating publisher, Nietzsche had been struggling to make ends meet in Italy, and it had been easy for the sister to step in as his caretaker because, after all, she'd been coming to clean his room while he was in school, and thereafter she would visit wherever he went, so anyone who knew Nietzsche had already become acquainted with the sister. Much of what she wrote about him after his death pointed to his quote-unquote battle courage and she used Southern Bell talk describing his days of glory during the Franco-Prussian War, and Nietzsche's sister would later dis destroy any correspondence from him that hinted at feelings of love for anyone other than herself. After Nietzsche's sister had visited him, visited him at the Wagner's house in Switzerland, she wrote in her diary about a walk in the garden by moonlight, with Cosima wearing a pink cashmere gown and Nietzsche wearing a black velvet cloak. And Nietzsche had made sure that Wagner thought he was a disciple, but Nietzsche had done it all for Cosima. The first time he'd spent the night at the Wagner's, Nietzsche had been a professor for six weeks, and he had visited a couple dozen times in 1869 and had thought it was wonderful that he could worship Cosima and Wagner didn't seem to notice. Cosima called him Poor Nightbird, and much of his writing would be about her, and she is in Twilight of the Idols, and he wrote Ecce Homo about staying with the Wagner's. Cosima would outlive Wagner by 50 years, and she would die in 1930, and Hitler quickly turned her house into a shrine. Nietzsche's sister had moved to Paraguay in 1887 with her husband and 14 other families to start a new Germany, a racially pure colony, and Nietzsche's sister would come back to old Germany four years after her husband killed himself in 1889, but it could have been murder. Hitler would whistle long passages of Wagner, and he liked to blame the same destiny and fate that permeated the Wagnerian operas, and Hitler readily succumbed to the sensitivity to the hand and Hitler <laughs> Hitler readily succumbed to a sensitivity to the hand of the ancient Nordic spirits in all his affairs. Hitler wanted to take away all the suffering and illness out of Germany, just as the chivalric heroes had done, beginning with birth defects and the mentally ill, and then moving on to all who could not participate in his dream of a restored sacred Germanic kingdom. For the first time since Bismarck's great victory of 1871, and before that, all the way back to the time of the lost crystal, Hitler tried to reclaim the German people's place in history, and in Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche wrote, One pays heavily for coming to power. Power makes stupid. The Germans, once they were called the people of thinkers, do they think at all today? The Germans are now bored with the spirit. The Germans now mistrust the spirit. Politics swallows up all serious concern for really spiritual matters. Deutschland, Deutschland, uber alles. I fear that was the end of German philosophy. The Porter, Portable Nietzsche, page 506. What the German spirit might be, who has not had his melancholy ideas about that? But this people has deliberately made itself stupid for nearly a millennium. Nowhere have the two great European narcotics, alcohol and Christianity, been abused more dissolutely. Recently, even a third has been added, one that alone would be sufficient to dispatch all fine and bold flexibility of the spirit. Music, our constipated, constipating German music. How much disgruntled heaviness, lameness, dampness, dressing gown. How much beer there is in the German intelligence. The Portable Nietzsche, page 506-7. 
Nietzsche's first book had gotten a cool reception from the scholarly academic types who were not amused with his book describing how he, quote, sat down in an alpine recess, bemused and bedeviled. Oh, my soul, I taught you to say today and one day informally, and to dance away over all here and there and yonder. Oh, my soul, I delivered you from all nooks. I brushed dust, spiders, and twilight off you. Oh, my soul, I washed the little bashfulness and the nook virtue off you, and persuaded you to stand naked before the eyes of the sun. With the storm that is called spirit, I blew over your wavy sea. I blew all clouds away. O oh, my soul, I taught you to persuade so well that you persuade the very ground, like the sun who persuades even the sea to his own height. O oh, my soul, I gave you new names and colorful toys. I gave your soil all wisdom to drink, all the new wines, and also all the immemorially old strong wines of wisdom. O oh, my soul, I poured every sun out on you, and every night, and every silence, and every longing. Then you grew up like a vine. O oh, my soul, over rich and heavy, you now stand there like a vine with swelling udders and crowded brown gold grapes, crowded and pressed by your happiness waiting in your superabundance and still bashful about waiting and verily o oh my soul who could see your smile and not be melted by tears the angels themselves are melted by tears because of the over graciousness of your smile o oh my soul behold i myself smile as i say this before you sing with a roaring song till all seas are silenced that they may listen to your longing till over silent longing sees the bark floats the golden wonder around whose gold all good bad wondrous things leap towards the golden wonder the nameless one for whom only future songs will find names O oh, my soul, now I have given you all, and even the last I had, and I have emptied all my hands to you, and let me be thankful, thus spoke Zarathustra. Portable Nietzsche, Zarathustra, third part on the great longing, translated by Kaufman, page 333-6. to six. But at some future time, a time stronger than our effete self-doubting present, the true Redeemer will come whose surging creativity will not let him rest in any shelter or hiding place, whose solitude will be misinterpreted as a flight from reality, whereas it will in fact be a dwelling on, a dwelling in reality, so that when he comes forth into the light, he may bring with him the redemption of that reality from the curse placed upon it by a lapsed ideal, this man of the future who will deliver us both from a lapsed ideal and from all that this ideal has spawned, violent loathing, the will to extinction, nihilism, this great and decisive stroke of midday, midday, who will make the will free once more and restore to the earth its aim and to man his hope, this antichrist and anti-nihilist conqueror of both God and unbeing, one day he must come. <clears throat> but why go on? 25. But why go on? I've reached the term of my speech. To continue here would be to usurp the right of one younger, stronger, more pregnant with future than I am, the right of Zarathustra, impious Zarathustra. Genealogy of Mor Morals, translated by Golfing, page 229-30. Nietzsche translated flatly into English, and into French he took on an additional dimension. And his understanding of anarchy was not people running amuck in the streets, but puffy people sitting behind desks every day without doing any good. 